DC Universe Classics fans, welcome back to another director's commentary for me, Scott Toy Guru Knightlick, the brand manager for most of DCU Classics, pretty much the first 19 waves, and today we're doing wave 13, which is, you know, less than 19, so it fits nicely in there. We're definitely into some obscure characters, or at least, you know, secondary tertiary with, uh, you know, Superboy from the 90s, our kind of token Superman of the wave, but not quite Superman. Blue Beetle, but not the Ted Cord or Dan Garrett version, but the uh, the modern one that DC actually really wanted us to do. Instead of Wonder Woman, we had Wonder Girl, or Donna Troy, as she is often known. See how we're kind of getting into, like, variants of main characters now, because we've already done all the main ones? So we're kind of doing, like, their, their sidekicks or their kid versions at this point. To uh, complement having a Wonder Woman character, we always like to sort of, you know, pair heroes with villains. So Cheetah became a uh, an obvious one to do. We'd already done Ares, so she became kind of the second Wonder Woman villain, and we did a variant of her in her modern outfit, which I'll actually get to a whole story about her in a few minutes. This was kind of crazy one. And, of course, our token superpowers figure, now that we've done pretty much all the fourth world figures, it was time to start breaching out into other superpowers. And Cyclotron was up on the list, and there's actually a whole story behind him, too. These are lots of stories. That's what the director's commentary is all about. Blue Devil, because, you know, we've had enough of Red Devil, so let's do a Blue Devil. Well, Blue Devil's a very established DC character, but definitely not A or B, maybe even C tier. So, you know... Same with Negative Man here. I mean, we are into, you know, we're scooping deep into the barrel at this point. We're, you know, we're through with the crust, which had, you know, the top guys on it. There's our alternate version of Negative Man with the Bill Benneke, of course, created see-through face. You can always tell it's a Bill Benneke design because he goes the extra mile. And then Trigon was our Build-A-Figure. Also kind of, you know, again, I wouldn't call him an odd choice, but an interesting choice for a Build-A-Figure. Again, you know, not a top character, but one that is very impressive looking. And uh, that was Wave 13, but let's get into all the dirty, ditty, gritty details of this wave and what made it so cool And as we uh, continue. So first up, we're going to talk about Deanna Troy, who, of course, everyone knows is the therapist on board the Enterprise. De I'm kidding. It's Donna Troy. She's the Wonder Girl, the... Uh, kind of a young version, sidekick version of Wonder Woman. She's had that red outfit. She's had black outfits. She's had many outfits. We, we decided to kind of go for the, the original, the classic version uh, with the red, with the gold stars and the uh, lasso attached to her waist. Pretty straightforward. Uh, you know, it's, it was a way of keeping, you know, a Wonder Woman-esque character in the wave. It's, you know, someone that kids and casual collectors may recognize, and even if they recognize her as Wonder Woman, that's great. And that was kind of the whole idea, you know, as, you know, same with Superboy, is having characters that, while we've already done the main versions, we can now kind of do secondary versions. Eventually, uh, Wonder Girl was done in the, uh, the multiverse line after I left. Uh, it's one of the few multiverse figures I actually really wanted to get, um, since she really, you know, this character kind of De you know, could have been in DCU Classics proper. But, uh, yeah, Wonder Woman family growing steadily. And in that vein, Wonder Woman villains. And pretty much kind of your top villain for Wonder Woman is Cheetah. Uh, you could say Ares. I mean, there's definitely other characters. But I think, be especially because of her presence on the Super Friends show and, you know, how, you know, all the stuff she did in the Silver Age... Cheetah, through her many iterations, tends to be kind of the go, you know the go-to Wonder Woman villain, like the Joker for Batman or Lex Luthor for Superman, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So the question of which version of Cheetah to do, well, this was a whole fun bag of wax, and let's jump into that. So we did two versions of Cheetah. We did modern and we did classic, uh, very deliberately, you know, because we knew there were fan bases for both. And we didn't think we we didn't know if we'd get a chance to revisit Cheetah later on, and she was kind of a character that you really wanted to get both versions out. Now the classic version was pretty straightforward, and she's clearly wearing, I guess what you would call a cheetah suit, uh, you know, with a tail. You know, you can see her human face, you can see kind of the line that goes down her bust, where there's skin. 
So it's clearly a cheetah suit. Now, on the other hand, the modern version that we chose to do was the version where she's kind of turned into a cheetah. And it's not so much a cheetah suit as it is, I guess, fur, you could say, covering her body. And this is where we run into some fun. So we did the figure. It was approved by DC. It was approved by middle management. It was all set with engineering, design, uh, you know, deco, all, the whole nine yards. It even was produced and in package. And Mattel Legal got a hold of the figures. They do every toy Mattel makes. And they took a look at her and said, wait a minute, she's naked. I was like, what do you mean she's naked? She's not naked. She's, she's covered with fur. I mean, that's like saying, you know, Goofy's a dog while walking Pluto. I mean, it's craziness. Like, no, no, no. This is not a, like something to argue about. She's not naked. She's wearing fur. And I actually got to use the Chewbacca defense, which is pretty cool. Because how many times in life can you really say you used the true Chewbacca defense and actually brought up Chewbacca in order to defend your argument. And I did. I brought in a whole bunch of Chewbacca action figures because I'm also a Star Wars collector. And I was like, look, Chewbacca's not naked. He's wearing fur. I mean, you know, would you put shorts on Chewbacca? Like, fans would think that's weird. It was not a fight I could win. Legal was like, no, I'm sorry. She's naked. You have to put clothes on her. So Bill Beneke, being the, you know, design genius he is, figured out that we could do a version of her with the black uh, pants and halter top and just paint them on with deco, which is what we did. And that's why there wound up being three versions of Cheetah, the modern one having the black pants and halter top painted on, because we had to do that as a running change after Mattel Legal decided that she was naked. So, hey, that's why it exists. But because we already had a, a chunk of PP production done of her without the halter top and pants painted on, we had, you know, a, a couple thousand units of her in without it. I guess you would call it naked cheetah. I call it furry cheetah. I mean, come on, it's fur. No human being looks like this. So these, I believe, were supposed to go to Amazon. We figured that this way it wouldn't wind up in stores for kids to see and get freaked out that they were buying a naked woman action figure, even though I still don't think it's naked. There might have been a mix-up or some went to retail or some places it wasn't supposed to go, but it, it was very few units, but they did make it out. So if you have one, it's, it's kind of one of the rarer variants in all of the DCU classics. But there you go. There's the story. All right. A less naked character, although still, you know, arms, legs, and chest showing, is Blue Devil, one of those awesome 1970s characters had a really cool modern look as well, where he's... Why is everyone in modern has paint-on black shirts? It's, is that like a thing? Like, the modern versions all uh, have tight black shirts or black halter tops on? Must be a DC thing. He made an appearance in the Justice League Unlimited show, mostly in the background. I don't know... I don't think he ever had a speaking role. Uh, but he did have an action figure in the Justice League Unlimited line, and this was one of those figures that was originally packed one per case, and kind of flew off the pegs. And this was one of the biggest mistakes and learning curves I made when I first came on the JLU line. I reissued the Blue Devil JLU figure, and it just sat there, and it became a peg warmer. And that was my first learner that characters that are meant, you know, aimed at collectors don't necessarily sell to kids, and that kids really are the biggest buyers of an action figure line. And Blue Devil, the DCU Classics figure, does, you know, appeal to kids. I mean, he... Basically looks like a blue monster, you know, if you will, but he's a hero. That's he's got great colors with the with the yellow and the dark blue outfit, and he's got an awesome weapon, like a trident kind of poking stick thingy. So, you know, unless uh you're anti-devil or you know you see this as a religious thing, he's a cool figure, whether you're a kid or a collector. And again, that's why DCU Classic worked so well as a toy line. We were able to get figures out there for the collectors, but also ones that would appeal to kids. You know, to a kid, this could either be a hero or just like a monster character, you know, with horns. So, you know, it's like win-win, if you will. And he also came with the big giant body chunk of Trigon. So, you know, you get red and blue together. Hey, why not? It's like a red devil and a blue devil. Superboy. Don't call him boy. 
So this was Superboy from the 1990s, specifically the Reign of Superman storyline that followed up on the death of Superman and funeral for a friend. And boy, is this guy 90s. I mean, come on, anybody who wears a uh, black leather jacket with the S shield on the back and has glasses and a, uh, an earring, I mean, this was definitely a way of, like, of DC being like, yeah, Superman is new and hip and cool for kids in the 90s. And, you know, he actually, he was. Um, you know, he wound up being a clone of, well, I think it was actually of Superman and Lex Luthor, if I remember my story correctly. This, well, my first DC comic was a comic with Eclipso on the cover. This was the first DC storyline that I followed. It came out, one, uh, the summer came out, I was at summer camp, and the counselors were bringing home issues on their days off so we could all follow what was happening in the cabin. So they, like, we would pass it around from bunk to bunk, and that was a really cool way of reading the story, and it was really my big intro to DC Comics. It was really fun. It was like a communal experience where the whole bunk would read each issue every time a counselor came home or came back from his day off and stopped at the comic store. We did wind up doing Connor Kent, which became his name, later on in his more modern version. And you know, for the longest time, I didn't realize that this Connor Kent was the same character as the 90s Superboy. Um, and then like one day, I mean, this was, you know, pretty metallic. It occurred to me, I was like, oh, it's the same character. I get it. He's grown up a little bit and he's not wearing his 90s outfit anymore. I know, I'm slow on the uptake sometimes. We did another version of Superboy 2, which I'm actually going to get to in the next video. I think this actually might be my favorite Superboy, because this is like classic Silver Age Superboy from the Legion of Superheroes pack, complete with his Legion ring, but we'll get to him in the next one. Either way, Superboy was not a figure that was neglected in the DCU Classics line. He had quite a few iterations, and they're all pretty much quite different, which I think is, uh, you know, what, what makes doing so many versions not only possible, but important. And, you know, you're not just, you know, putting out the same version over and over again. I mean, come on, S-Shield on the back of a jacket. All right, Blue Beetle, another character that's had a lot of iterations in the DC Universe. I mean, Dan Garrett, Ted Kord, and now we have the modern Blue Beetle, which basically took the whole Blue Beetle concept of, you know, just a regular sort of Batman-y, rich man hero, to kind of more of a robotic transformation. The Scarab Beetle is actually an alien technology thing. But you know what? It works. And it really works from a toy standpoint. I mean, I'm honestly, Blue Beetle, the, the modern Blue Beetle, is probably one of the most toyetic figures in the entire DC Pantheon. Probably up there with, with Batman and Metal Men as far as, you know, figures that just work as toys that would appeal to kids. For a collector, you know, you're going to get to build out your teams, which, you know, we, we do that intentionally as well. But for kids who may know this character from the animation or just see him, you know, and he looks cool, he's like an outer space bug, the fact that, you know, in his armor can transform and grow wings and grow weapons on the arms, that's what makes a toyetic. I mean, he's got like that instant transformation where he can, you know, just grabbing that scarab beetle, he automatically gets his armor put on, kind of like Iron Man in the uh, Infinity War and Endgame movies when you know, with the nanotech stuff that he borrows from Wakanda or whatever happens off screen. That whole instant transformation of, you know, character to suiting up into armor is very, very aspirational for kids because the idea of an instant transformation is easily understood. You know, it goes back to Shazam and He-Man and... You know, anyone who can just go from, you know, sort of mode A to mode B. So, uh, yeah, Blue Beetle was awesome. And you know who was also awesome? The Doom Patrol. And we did a Doom Patrol figure here in the form of Negative Man, who was our second Doom Patrol character. We never got to the Chief. I called him the Professor last time, like over and over again, because I must have had X-Men on my brain. But his name is the Chief, and we never did him. And I wish we did. We got a lot of slack that we didn't do the chief, but I think it was because of the whole wheelchair, having to tool that up, and I don't know, yada yada, but we did get to Elastigirl to complete the core team, and again, you know, Bill Beneke, huge Doom Patrol fan, he was the one who made sure uh, Robot Man had the, the, the removable cap for his brain, and now for uh, Negative Man, not to be confused with H.G. Wells' Invisible Man, although... They definitely have a similar look with the whole bandages wrapped around the face. 
and the uh, the glasses. Although Invisible Man actually had a fake nose, which they sometimes leave off in the movies and stuff. But if you read the book, he does have that fake nose on. Negative Man, not so much with the fake nose, but he does have the bandaged head, and uh, you know to keep his negative version bandaged up, which meant he needed new hands too. So he did have some new tooling. But yeah, come on, Doom Patrol getting bigger, getting uh, closer to being a full team. And I know I'm a broken record here, but yeah, Bill Beneke with the alternate version with the see-through face, that's, that's what Bill does. I mean, he comes up with these great ways of doing variant versions of characters that, that not only work for collectors, but would appeal to kids too, because kids can, you know, get it. Speaking of a figure kids might be able to get, and a kid did get, Cyclotron. Who the heck is Cyclotron, and how did he wind up in a main DCU Classics wave? I mean, come on, you got to be kidding me. Like, probably the most obscure figure we ever did at this point. In a main wave, like, not like a Comic-Con thing. So Cyclotron is from Superpowers. Um, he's from the line of toys from the 80s that Kenner put out. Kind of, it's outside of Mego, was kind of one of the first major DC lines. His superpower was to remove his face and chest plate and show his robotic insides. I know, it's crazy, but he was designed to be a toy, and that's why he works. He did make some comic book appearances. I mean, it's not like he was completely outside of the DC universe and only appeared as a toy. Often, you know, when he appeared in comics, it was alongside other superpowers characters like Golden Pharaoh there. But Cyclotron, as I said, you know, designed as a toy, works as a toy. And a big reason that he wound up in this wave and, you know, kind of early on, as we, we sort of dove into the Superpowers figures, now that we were done with the fourth world Kirby characters from Superpowers. So, as I mentioned, Bill Beneke, not only a huge fan of Superpowers, he, he told me this whole story about finding Cyclotron on shelf. And the first time he ever saw or heard of this character when he was a kid was when he found the figure hanging on a peg and was like, whoa, a new character I've never heard of or never seen before. And I remember him at lunch telling me this whole story just about like, it was such a pivotal moment for him in his childhood, finding this figure on shelf and buying it with his own money and that, you know, a character that you know, could hang out with Batman and Superman, but he'd never heard before. It was like a character just for him, you know, that was like, you know, brand new for his generation. So... Bill was obviously very keen to get him in the wave. All right. From uh, the fact that we're now looking at a leg as we scrolly slow down, we're obviously now talking about our Collect and Connect TM and copyright figure for this wave, who is none other than the villainous villain Trigon. Ah, Trigon. A character that doesn't really show up that much in the toy aisle, even though he's like a giant red devil-y horned, stag-horned, double-eyed. I mean, it's like a giant monster. I mean, you know, what kid doesn't want this in their collection? You can just tell he's the bad guy, right? Right from looking at him. Look at that face sculpt. That's the four horsemen right there. Again, amazing. They are amazing sculptors. The way they can just capture characters' unique looks and just make them look so badass as toys. Trigon had a fabric cape, the first one in DCU Classics even though here he's wearing Imperiex's arms, I thought it looked really cool because the cape had this wire in it which would make it stand out like that, so that's why I used this shot. Plus the Imperiex arms were interchangeable. So hey, if you wanted to give him Imperiex's arms, you could. But the cape had this wire, which made it cool because you could pose the cape and you could put him on a throne and the cape would drape down perfectly. And that's why sometimes fabric capes are awesome. It's always a toss-up with fans, fabric cape or plastic cape. But in this case, we went plastic, or sorry, we went fabric with the wire. And it worked, and he's awesome. And, uh, you know, you can rule your underworld too. <laughs>